It's 8 p.m. and here are our top stories in 90 seconds. More debate over a third COVID vaccine booster shot. Some say our most vulnerable populations need the extra dose as soon as possible. The evidence is there that immunosuppressed individuals need a booster and they need it now. But most agree the science still isn't there. We don't know yet whether that actually will protect them from getting seriously ill with COVID. The U.S. is hard at work trying to get holdouts to get their first dose. Vaccine rates are rising and full approval from the FDA could help hesitant Americans decide to get the shot. I do hope it's gonna be within the next couple of weeks. They said hopefully by the end of the month. I hope it's even sooner than that. As the Delta variant spreads, Colorado school districts are coming out with mass guidelines. And no matter what they decide, it seems that controversy quickly follows. I'm a mom of three kids, and I truly believe that masking a child is child abuse. We had heard that there were other parents that were kind of organizing for the opposite, saying that they didn't want any COVID restrictions whatsoever and putting a lot of pressure on uh, kind of public servants. Hundreds of parents protesting the Jeffco student mask mandate saying parents should be able to choose, while others say the district needs to make masks mandatory. Good Wednesday evening, and thank you for watching Denver 7 News on Local 3. I'm Jessica Porter. We begin with the third COVID vaccine booster shot. U.S. and World Health officials saying the science isn't there and we don't need it yet. But doctors are saying it could help people with compromised immune systems. Denver 7's Eddie Guajardo spoke with a Colorado doctor who was part of the original clinical trials for the vaccine on why he thinks a third shot could be helpful. The Delta variant is spreading and it could pose a greater threat for people with weak immune systems, even if they're vaccinated. A higher risk of breakthrough inf infection. People battling cancer, have chronic conditions that require treatment, or have had a transplant are at a greater risk of getting severely sick if they get the virus. Being hospitalized and they have a, uh, a risk of death. Dr. Thomas Campbell with UC Health oversaw two major clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines. He says while the vaccines available are up to 94% effective, people with compromised immune systems are less responsive to the shot. Drops more to the 40 to 50% range. Their immune systems are suppressed, so they don't make the high level of antibodies that are needed to protect against uh, COVID. He says about half of the time, even after both shots, antibody levels can't be detected. To help protect those people from the deadly virus? The evidence is there that immunosuppressed individuals need a booster and they need it now. A third shot to increase their antibodies, but more evidence is needed. We don't know yet whether that actually will protect them from getting seriously ill with COVID. The CDC is considering a third shot for people with compromised immune systems, but no decision has been made. Well, I think it should be rolled out today, but we're not there. On Wednesday, the World Health Organization called for a halt in the booster shot until the end of September, so the current supply can go to those who need their first or second dose. But Dr. Campbell questions that move. I don't think that giving that select subgroup of individuals a third dose is going to have a big impact on our efforts to expand vaccine access around the world. He says the immunocompromised make up less than 2% of the population in the U.S. and can spread the virus at a greater risk if they're not protected. They will shed virus in their upper respiratory tract at higher levels and for longer periods of time than people who are not immunosuppressed. He strongly advises people with weak immune systems to wear masks, socially distance, and wash their hands. Addie Guardo, Denver 7. In San Francisco, hospitals are allowing patients who received Johnson & Johnson's single dose vaccine to get a second shot from either Pfizer or, or Moderna. The city's health department says J&J &J recipients can request a supplemental dose of one of the mRNA vaccines. A senior White House official says the FDA could fully authorize, authorize Pfizer's vaccine by September, but top health officials like Dr. Fauci say it's possible that it could happen even sooner. All COVID vaccines currently only have emergency use approval. That has become a source of vaccine hesitancy for many Americans who say they're waiting for the full approval.
A new survey finds a majority of unvaccinated Americans believe COVID-19 vaccinations are more dangerous than the disease itself. The Kaiser Family Foundation surveyed 1,500 people, both vaccinated and unvaccinated. 53% of the unvaccinated people said they believe that. The survey also found that they are less likely to wear masks. 44% of unvaccinated people said they wear masks at grocery stores and other indoor places. Compare that to 55% of vaccinated people who do the same. The Delta variant now accounts for more than 93% of COVID cases in the U.S. In the Great Plains and Midwestern states, that number is even higher at 98%. At the end of May, the Delta variant was only responsible for about 3% of new COVID infections. Jeffco's mask rules for students aren't sitting well with some parents. Today, a couple of hundred parents and kids protested the mask order outside the Jefferson County Public Health Building. Denver 7's Gary Broad was there. Freedom not force. Freedom not force. We came out to be their voice because they don't have a voice in this. Freedom not force. Moms and dads made their voices heard in Lakewood. I'm a mom of three kids, and I truly believe that masking a child is child abuse. This large group gathered to show their opposition to Jeffco's new public school mask policy. Freedom, not force! Forcing students between 3 and 11 to wear masks at school, while students 12 and up have the option. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Having that choice for all students is what rally organizer Beth Parker says she's looking for. If you think it's safe to send your kids in a mask, then you should absolutely have the right and the ability to do that. But I also think that if you are comfortable sending your kids without a mask, you should have that option as well. Other Jeffco parents think it should be mandatory like Catherine Eterno, who spoke to Denver 7 earlier this week. We had heard that there were other parents that were kind of organizing for the opposite, saying that they didn't want any COVID restrictions whatsoever and putting a lot of pressure on uh, kind of public servants. She started a Facebook advocacy group supporting the school district's decision to follow the Jeffco Health Department's recommendations. If we don't kind of show that there are a lot of parents that want there to be protections in school, that want to keep their kids safe, then we've kind of given the school board no choice other than to listen to their more vocal constituents. Eterno was happy with the decision on masks required for younger students, but thought the mandate should cover all ages. If you were a parent who had kids in both age groups, it would be very concerning. Jeffco Public Health tells Denver 7 they fully respect community members' right to protest, but chose to close the building Wednesday in an abundance of caution. <laughs> Jefferson County Public Schools did not return our request for comment on the protesting of the new policy. In Lakewood, I'm Gary Broad, Denver 7. Parents of students in the Cherry Creek School District will have their choice of masking or not. The district announced today that all students and staff are encouraged to wear a mask in school, but it's not required. They will be required to wear a mask on the bus, though. A federal CDC order requires masks on public transportation. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock is responding to criticism over the vaccine mandate for all city employees. While on CNN, he recognized that the city may lose some workers and said the blame is all on them and their choice to not get the shot. We will work with employees and employers to continue to raise awareness, continue to let them know that the mandate is in place, and hopefully we get uh, gain compliance from that. But here's how I look at it. If you choose not to be vaccinated, and you are choosing to dismiss yourself from work and to lose, to fire yourself. So it's not the mayor, it's not your employer firing, you have made that decision as an individual. More than 100,000 Denver employees, including school teachers, must get the vaccine by the end of September. It's unclear what will happen if they don't. And Denver leaders are still looking for solutions to help those living on the streets. Today, the City Department of Housing and Stability released a five-year strategic plan. It's based on more than a year of public input from the community and those living on the streets themselves. The plan includes 14 goals, with many focused on equity. They also want to reduce homelessness by 50 percent and reduce evictions by 25% in 2026. They also hope to cut down the range of time that people experience homelessness to 90 days. Host hopes to achieve these goals by creating 7,000 new affordable homes and keep in place nearly 1,000 income-restricted rentals. 
The money for this plan was announced last week during the mayor's State of the City address. The mayor is allocating $28 million from the American Rescue Plan into the city's affordable housing fund to quickly build homes. For now, members from the Department of Housing Stability will take public comment on their five-year plan before presenting it to City Council in November. An update tonight at 8. Excel Energy has restored service to 95% of the customers affected by a natural gas outage last week. Just 30 customers are still without service. Excel says those people are not home and crews need to get inside to restore their pilot lights. A water line damaged the infrastructure in the Elyria Swansea neighborhood last week, leading to the outage. A boil water advisory is in effect for part of Inglewood tonight. If you live within this red shaded area, you need to boil your water before using it. A water sample tested positive for E. coli. This includes Swedish Medical Center and dozens of restaurants in downtown Inglewood. A water distribution center will be available tomorrow. It could take two to three days to resolve the problem. And this alert is only for Inglewood. Many of you likely got this emergency alert this afternoon. This went out to much of the metro areas not at all affected by the boil water order. A spokesperson with the city of Inglewood says it was a mistake. It's not my summer cabin. It's not a weekend cabin. This is where Kurt and I live year round. So we have no access. Several Larimer County residents unable to get to their homes after the only bridge to them is demolished. They say the necessary repairs were easy to make, but the county says it had to come down. There are several other residents over there that we're in contact with almost daily that say we understand what, yeah, we're disappointed. We understand what you're doing. Go ahead and do it. So. You know, this is a small majority of the property owners over there that are causing the commotion. With no plans to build a new bridge in the immediate future, these residents are left without a way home. They moved the cameras, they broke the cameras, and uh, hopefully they find them. Hopefully the police finds the cars. Plus eight cars stolen in a single day from a Lakewood car dealership. Police able to recover some of them, but the suspects are still out there.